Okay, let's try this again. I'm having trouble with my recording software today, and I have tried to record this a couple of times and it hasn't worked. So, sorry for the delay in posting this to my art and experience class, and I am hoping this will actually work today. Um, okay, so, so far in the class, we've talked about isms, which is like the different kind of broad strokes categories of art and how we talk about art. And then we talked about the elements and principles of art, which are kind of the basic things that we use to think about how we compose things and how, what art is, is basically made of. So we talked about things like color and line and value and texture and all of that kind of good stuff. So now we're gonna go into talking about techniques and media, okay? So we're going to go into some kind of broad categories. Today we're going to talk about drawing. We're also going to talk later uh, in the next coming weeks about painting, about photography, about sculpture, about installation art, about fiber art. So kind of big categories based on techniques and based on uh, media. Media being the plural of medium, though mediums is also acceptable to say now when talking about artwork, which kind of drives me crazy, but that's okay. Um, so what is the medium? The medium is what the work is made out of. So if you're in a museum and you're looking at a painting by uh, Vincent van Gogh, that painting under on the little tag next to it in the museum, it will say medium and you will see oil on canvas. And that's because it's oil paint on cotton canvas. So when I say medium or media, that is what I'm referring to. So we're going to talk about techniques and the different kinds of uh, specific techniques that fit into broad categories. Like today, we're going to talk about drawing. There's lots of different kinds of drawing. And then we're also going to talk about different materials or media that uh, those techniques are uh, made with. Okay, so first of all, um, I love talking about drawing. I teach drawing one and drawing two at OTC. So if this is a subject that you're interested in and you wanna learn more uh, and you wanna try it out more um, in a more structured classroom setting, uh, specifically about the technique, I'd love to see you in my drawing one class and then my drawing two class. Um, so let's just talk about kind of what we mean by drawing. So as artists, we think about drawing in a bunch of different ways. So one of the ways that uh, drawing is sort of thought about in the art world, particularly for people who um, are painters or sculptors or architects or people who do something other than drawing as their finished product, drawing is kind of thought about as like a means to an end. So it's sort of a first step when creating, okay? So for example, this is a, a preliminary composition sketch by a very famous artist. I'd wager most, if not all of you have heard of him. His name is Pablo Picasso. So if you know one artist's name, you probably know Picasso, right? Picasso is pretty famous. And he's very famous because he and George Brock invented a technique, pioneered a, a, a technique called cubism, which is a subset of the isms that we talked about. Um, but why I want to look at this is, so Picasso is predominantly remembered as a painter. He was also a sculptor. He was also a ceramicist. He was also a printmaker and he was also a drawer and did more finished drawings. But this particular drawing is a compositional sketch for a painting that he is going on to do. So before doing this painting, and it's a humongous painting, we're gonna look at it in just a minute. He wanted to lay down some ideas, some just kind of loose ideas about how the composition was going to work. And so he did that by creating this charcoal sketch. Um, it's hard to tell unless you really look, you know Picasso's work really well and really look at these elements. It's a little hard to tell what this drawing is for, but I'm going to show you. This is the compositional, first compositional drawing for Guernica. Guernica is one of Picasso's most famous paintings. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I suggest you look it up. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, here's a scale image for you so you can see how gigantic this painting is. These are grown men installing it. You can see there's five of them to lift just one painting and they're all like adult men probably around like six feet tall. So you can see that this is just a humongous painting. Um, so that's one way that drawing is thought of a lot. Is It's like uh, the thing you do before you work with your real medium. Um, that's not always the case. So I wanna show you a bunch of different examples where drawing is sort of a first step and then some examples where drawing is the end product as well. 
And then we're going to talk about the different kinds of drawing. So here we have our sketch, our preliminary sketch, uh, compositional sketch by Picasso, with Guernica. Uh, this is a drawing by a very famous uh, contemporary architect. She died tragically a few years ago. She was pretty young, but she's probably the most famous female architect of all time and one of the most famous contemporary architects, and that's Zaha Hadid. So if you're not familiar with Zaha Hadid, she's kind of amazing. Uh, so this is a preliminary drawing she did for um, a building project of hers that was the, um, okay, the Haydar Aliyev Center, the Haydar Aliyev Center. Um, so this is a really famous building that she designed. So here it is as a concept sketch, and here it is as an actual building. So you can see again this relationship, how things get worked out in drawing and then translated and transitioned into different kinds of media. Here's another example, and I bring this in. Um, does anyone recognize this just straight off the bat? Sometimes I have people who do. So I'm not a video game person. I, um, I think they're neat, but I've never really played them, so I don't really get them. But I have two teenage sons and also my husband, who is not a teenager, but also likes video games. So I'm around them a lot, so I absorb a lot of things about video games passively, kind of. So um, one of uh, the things that I like to bring in is this idea of drawing uh, with, in this case, this is uh, charcoal and ink, uh, to kind of sketch in concept art. So any video game you've ever played, any movie you've ever seen, it started with concept art. There was concept art, there were storyboards, there were sketches for characters, for weapons, for backgrounds, for settings. All of this happens um, on a drawing pad at some point. So I think that's kind of a neat thing to think about. So if you don't recognize this, this is from uh, the video game Skyrim, which is very popular in my household. <laughs> um, and this is from um, uh, Windhelm and it is the Palace of Kings. This is the original sketch for the idea. And then here's how it ends up looking in the actual game. So it's kind of neat to see these kind of processes where we have our original kind of concept sketches and then see what they actually end up looking like and how drawing plays this important underlying role in all these other different kinds of uh, creative industries, right? Architecture, video game design, painting. Um, so I just think it's kind of fun to look at these. Now, that isn't always the case. It, drawing isn't always just a preliminary first step. Sometimes drawing is the focus, it is the main event. So I wanna look at some different ways uh, and instances where that is true as well. Uh, this is a work by another really famous artist. He uh, has a Ninja Turtle named after him. So this is um, Leonardo da Vinci. You've probably heard of Leonardo da Vinci. He's the Renaissance man, very important artist from the Renaissance in Italy. Um, he was a painter, a drawer, an inventor, a scientist, a philosopher. And he also kept really extensive notebooks and sketchbooks. So this is a drawing from one of his sketchbooks. And it isn't an under sketch for anything. It isn't a concept art piece for a painting he's doing later. It's just a drawing. It's just a little sketch. And it just exists as a sketch in his sketchbook. So it probably wasn't really even meant to be seen by other people. It was just a little drawing exercise he was doing for himself. Uh, it's a drawing of a plant that is called, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Star of Bethlehem. So this is an example where this isn't a step to become something else. It's just art for its own sake. A drawing is the end all be all of this expression. And um, it's kind of lovely, right? It's a nice little study. It's a nice little uh, sketch. Here's a work that is also a drawing. This is by, and I wrote his last name down somewhere because I always have trouble with it. This is a contemporary artist. His name is Dirk uh, Dzimirsky. So it's D-Z-I-M-I-R-S-K-Y, Dzimirsky. And he's a contemporary hyper-realistic artist, meaning his works are so realistic they look like photographs. This is not a photograph. This is a graphite drawing. It's a portrait. So this is drawn in pencil and graphite, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So he isn't going to paint on this. This isn't an understudy for digital media or for oil painting or anything else. This is the finished piece and it's done entirely in graphite. Um, he's very skilled. He's obviously quite talented at hyper-realistic portrayals um, in drawing media. So you also have things like this where the drawing is the work in and of itself. So I just like to point out the different ways that drawing gets utilized in creative industries um, so that we have 
different ways to um, think about it and, and how it functions in terms of its place in the art world. Um, okay, so also there's lots of different kinds of media. Um, so we have different techniques. We also have lots of different media uh, that fit within the broader category of drawing. So let's talk about some of them and look at some examples. Uh, okay, so we're going to start with dry media, then we're going to talk about uh, liquid media, and then we're going to talk about digital media. So, the first one I want to talk about is the one that you're probably least familiar with, and that's metal point. Metal point is a little bit unusual uh, in, in this day and age. It was very popular at one point, and people still do it. You can still buy metal point tools. Uh, in town, there's an artist named um, Marion Stahl Chamberlain, who's a really fantastic metal point artist. She does lots of different kinds of art. I've had her come and talk to this class before, but she does a lot of silver point. Um, so what is metal point? So let's talk about just what it is. Um, a metal point drawing is made by applying a stylus. So stylus used to be a kind of an unknown term. When I would teach people about this, they didn't know what a stylus was. Now, because of technology, you might have a stylus for your video game machine. You might have a stylus for your tablet. You might have a stylus that you use on your phone. So stylus has become a relevant word again. It wasn't for a long time, but it's a very old word. And so in uh, metal point, you have a stylus. And in this case, the stylus is a thin rod of metal. And that thin rod of metal is inserted into a holder so that you can hold it more easily. Um, and uh, to make a metal point work, you take your stylus, your thin rod of metal in its uh, holder, which is wood or metal usually. Um, it used to, they were sometimes clay back in the olden times. And then you're going to make marks with that stylus by dragging it across a prepared surface. What do I mean by prepared surface? Usually the preparation of a surface for metal point involves coating um, a gesso-like ground uh, on kind of a medium thickness of paper. So not super heavy paper, not super light paper. Gesso, G-E-S-S-O, we'll talk about more when we talk about painting, but it is what is used, the most familiar time you may have seen it is if you've ever seen those pre-stretched canvases you can buy like at Michael's to paint on, they're white, right? So canvas naturally is kind of a neutral color. The white comes from the gesso. So the gesso kind of um, creates a, a treated surface that um, closes up all the pores, all the texture and the holes in the uh, fabric, in the canvas itself, so that it's easier to paint on. Um, so gesso can also be used to prepare things for metal point. And so it's kind of like paint. It's kind of like a thick white paint. And so you, you layer it on, uh, for, for metal point, it's usually paper. So you're usually layering it on paper, sometimes on wood panel. Um, and so you layer gesso on, and then you can add a little bit of paint to it to add these pigments if you want, if you don't want it to just be white. Okay, so you have your prepared ground, that's the surface of the paper with the gesso on it. You have your stylus that has either a rod of gold or uh, silver or copper in it. And uh, you're going to move, you're going to draw with that uh, stylus across the ground, across the prepared paper. And as you do that, the textured ground kind of grabs the rod a little bit and then the stylus deposits minuscule little bitty particles of metal, and that's what creates the mark. So you're literally making the mark with the gold, silver, or copper inside your stylus. Um, okay, so let's look at some examples of that. So here on the left, we have gold and silver point together. In the upper right, we have silver point, and in the lower, we have uh, copper point. And I think silver point on that one as well, a little bit of chalk. So you can see it looks like just like a drawing, right? It kind of just looks like a drawing, but it has, when you see it in person, first of all, it's engraved in just a teeny bit, like it's pressed, the lines press in a little bit. Um, and then second, it has this little bit of iridescent metallic sheen. So if you look at it, one of these up close and kind of tilt it back and forth, you can see the little bits of metal kind of creating a little bit of shine. Okay, next we're going to talk about graphite. We already talked about graphite a teeny bit when we were looking at Dirk uh, Dzemirsky's hyper-realistic um, portraits earlier. So um, I start each of these with this image that has all the kind of tools of each uh, medium so you can see what is used. So graphite is a metallic gray writing and drawing material that is most commonly used in pencils. So when you're drawing with pencil, that's called 
graphite. Um, and uh, it's most commonly in pencil form. You can also get graphite powder, just loose graphite powder that you can use. Um, you can also get it in compressed sticks, kind of like charcoal. We'll talk about charcoal in a minute. In the upper left-hand corner here, you can see a compressed graphite stick with string wrapped around it to kind of keep your fingers from smudging on the graphite. Um, you also, below that, have different kinds of styluses with graphite in them. Um, those are just kind of holders to hold the compressed graphite. And then on the right, you see all the different kinds of pencils. So graphite comes in different hardnesses and softnesses. That's denoted by the number and letter at the end there. So like a number two pencil you've heard of. So um, that is similar to an HB pencil when you're looking at uh, pencils for drawing. So you have H's and B's and those kind of indicate how hard or soft the graphite is. Uh, okay, what is graphite? Well, the mineral graphite exists in nature. It can be mined out of the ground and it is a crystalline uh, form of the element carbon. Most things, a lot of things are made out of carbon, right? Where carbon-based life forms, graphite is a crystalline form of carbon. Um, the earliest known uses of it as a drawing material date back to about the 16th century in Europe. Um, it doesn't become really popular until the 18th century, until the late 18th century. And of course, it's still popular today and, and widely used. Um, I, I like words a lot. I like to talk about words. So I'm also going to tell you where the word pencil comes from. So the word pencil comes from a Latin word called uh, uh, paniculus. And paniculus in Latin means brush, not like a hairbrush or a toothbrush, but like a brush that scribes would use to write with. So not even really like a paintbrush, not as wide as that, but thinner and meant for writing, like a calligraphy brush kind of. So paniculus meant brush in Latin. And that is where we get the word pencil. There you go. Um, the kind of contemporary version of the pencil was originally, what it's based on was originally thought of by a guy, uh, a French guy named um, Nicolas Jacques uh, Comte, um, C-O-N-T-E. And so he uh, came up with this idea for taking graphite, kind of cheaper, less pure graphite, mixing it with clay to create this kind of holder on it so that you could write with it more easily. Um, and then that idea gets adapted into the wooden sheath that becomes the kind of standard pencil. And then of course today we have mechanical pencils that are uh, plastic or metal, right? So Conte uh, is the guy who comes up with that and that's in the late 1700s, I think. Um, okay. Let's see, let's, let's look at some examples of graphite. So graphite can be used for uh, light underdrawings, uh, for um, if you're going to do acrylic painting. It can also be used in and of itself uh, to create hyper-realistic drawings like some of these or softer drawings or less realistic drawings. There's, it has a whole wide range of expressive possibilities, especially when you have a whole range of artist pencils where you have different hardnesses and softnesses. Um, so graphite is very versatile in terms of a drawing medium. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about charcoal. Um, charcoal is made from the twigs of a willow tree or vines that are then uh, cooked, basically. They're superheated inside a compartment, um, inside a vessel that has no oxygen allowed in. And so it basically burns them, but they stay contained. They don't fall apart. And so then you get these kind of, if you look over here, these long kind of sticks that we call vine charcoal. Um, and this medium has been popular since the Renaissance. Uh, it also comes in different hardnesses like pencils. Usually it's just hard, medium, or soft. Um, and you can get it in these raw vine charcoal sticks. You can get compressed harder charcoal sticks. You can get it in pencil form. You can also get it in powder form, like this little vial that you see there. And then there's all kinds of tools that you can use with it, okay? So charcoal's great. Um, it's used a lot for the underdrawings for oil paint. It's also um, used in and of itself. It's very expressive. It's great when you need something really, really dark. It gets much darker than graphite. Um, and you can use it in a really precise way, or you can use it in a more expressive kind of way. It has sort of a natural uh, drama to it. So um, if you take art history with me, you will learn about the Baroque period and a uh, technique called chiaroscuro or tenebrism. 
And basically all that means is really dramatic lighting, super, super high contrast, black, black, dark, 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 black, and bright, 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 bright highlights right next to each other. And so charcoal is great for things like that because it creates such a nice, dark, rich kind of uh, concentration of pigment. Um, okay, so let's look at some examples of charcoal. So you can have more uh, expressive kind of things like the thing on the left. You can have uh, more expressive kind of looser, but still more realistic looking like in the bottom, right? I love charcoal for doing figure drawing, for doing new drawings. It's my favorite medium for that. And then you can also use it extremely precisely like the image of the rhino in the upper right, that's also charcoal. So depending on what you wanna do, charcoal is great for a lot of different things. Okay, uh, next we're gonna talk about um, pastel. So pastel is something you probably did maybe in high school, uh, I would think. Usually people come in with some experience with it. So pastel is fabricated from one of several um, very finely ground up pigments. And when I say pigment, that's what gives things like paint their color. Okay, so finely ground up pigment. And then usually there'll be something that's like a pulverized white powder, an inert powder that doesn't really affect it that much. So something like um, a white filler like uh, calcium carbonate, ground calcium carbonate, or um, ground uh, kaolin or something like that, which is basically like chalk. Okay, so ground up and included in there to kind of dilute the pigment a little bit and then just a little bit of a binder. And the binder is often um, gum uh, tracacanth or, or gum arabic, just a little bit of like, a, a binder is like a glue, right? It's something that, that is an adhesive that holds it together. So all these powders are mixed up, a little bit of binder, and then they're pressed and rolled into these sticks, like what you see above. And they're usually, that's the most common form. You can also get them in little discs like this that almost look like uh, little like eyeshadows. You can also get them in um, pastel pencil form, so they have wood around the outside so it doesn't get on your fingers as much. Um, okay, uh, pastel is usually used on paper. A few artists I can think of use it on canvas, but it's almost always used on paper. Um, and pastel was first used in the 16th century in Europe, um, most notably, notably by our friend Leonardo da Vinci. He liked to sketch with pastel. Um, and then it, it's still popular today. It is uh, most famously probably associated with the impressionist French artist Degas. So you may have seen some of Degas' impressionistic ballerinas that he likes to do in, um, in pastel. Those are quite famous. Let's just look at some examples. So you can have quite expressive qualities of line. You can get really nice, rich color. There's a lot of different ways to use pastel. Okay, next I want to talk about chalk. Chalk and pastel are quite closely related. You can use them together. Uh, pastel is kind of a subset of chalk. Um, so red, black, and white chalk are all naturally occurring. You can dig them out of the ground. They just exist. They're naturally occurring minerals and they're just mined right out of the ground. Um, the white can also be dyed. So like sidewalk chalk is often just dyed white chalk. Um, and this is another one that's been around like as long as charcoal. You know, they were using charcoal to draw on the walls in caves in the Paleolithic period. Um, they're using chalk there as well. So literally since the Paleolithic prehistoric times, um, naturally occurring chalks and then charcoal, but like not as refined of charcoal, but just like burnt wood from a campfire were used to draw on walls in, in, in cave paintings. So these are very, very old drawing media. Um, Michelangelo, another famous artist with a Ninja Turtle name after him, used to use uh, red chalk quite a lot for many of his studies for sculptures and paintings. Red chalk is also used quite often in the underdrawings for frescoes, which are the uh, paintings done on the walls in uh, cathedrals and things in the Renaissance. So here's some examples of chalk. You have, um, you know, your kind of traditional white chalk on a black ground. You have this uh, sort of representational fun sort of glowy dinosaur. Um, and then of course, there's all kinds of street festivals now where people do trump loi, which means a trick of the eye, um, sort of things like this out of sidewalk chalk that make these fantastic illusions. Okay, so let's talk about liquid media. So here we're really just going to talk about ink and uh, we'll look at different examples of it being applied with a pen and being applied with a brush. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can use ink. 
there's um, things like Sharpies, which are like our um, contemporary felt tip pens. Uh, you have ballpoint pens, you have uh, brushes, you have bamboo calligraphy uh, quills, you have literal feather quills, you have uh, the, the nib, uh, different kinds of steel nibbed pens uh, that you use with an inkwell. Um, you can use brushes with ink, all different kinds of things can be used with ink. Drawing inks are uh, water-based media, so they're aqueous, made from various plant and mineral colorants. Okay, so they can be made out of different things. Um, I like to say that we tend to think of ink as being this really dark black. When we're looking at historic drawings and in ink, a lot of them are actually um, kind of brown and reddish brown and gray. Sometimes they're black, but that doesn't mean they aren't ink. They're still ink. And contemporarily, you can buy all different kinds of um, aqueous and also um, alcohol-based inks in all different kinds of color. Um, so I had a student a few years ago in this class, actually, who asked me what ink was made out of. And I'd never had anyone ask me that, and I didn't know. So I added this slide so I can tell you what ink is made out of. So let's talk about that for a minute. So there's four types of ink derived from natural substances that have traditionally been used for drawing. There are a few other things that are used for ink, and we're going to talk about a couple of them. But these are the big four for drawing. So um, basically, they are uh, carbon-based, which is also called... Uh, lamp black, so that's our first one here, there's iron gall, there's bistra, and then there's logwood. And those are the four substances you see here, and then the resulting inks are in the caps below, so you can literally see what they're made out of. So now I'm just going to tell you what all those things are. So lamp black, which is also carbon-based, is um, made out of soot. So soot is like in your chimney, like uh, the black stuff left over from the fire is the soot. So they're made from, um, so it's a soot-based ink that's made from burning oil or pine resin. And then the leftover resulting soot is then scraped up and mixed with water and that becomes the ink. So that's our first one. Iron gall ink is a combination of metal salts and natural materials. So it's made a bunch of different ways. The most common way that it was made, and it was really popular starting in the 12th century and up through the late uh, 19th century, and then it's kind of replaced by synthetics and is not used as much. But uh, some people still use it today. Obviously, you can see the ingredients of it there. Um, so basically what it is, most commonly, is it's gall nuts, which are those little like nut-like things on the side. And those get ground up and mixed with ferrous sulfate, which is a kind of... Um, rust, basically iron rust, which is um, like from metal filings that have rusted. And then gum arabic is what holds it together. So all that gets ground up and mixed together and then added to water. And that's how you get iron gall ink. It makes like a really nice rich black, actually. Bistre, uh, B-I-S-T-R-E, is made with wood soot collected from chimneys, literally. So I was telling you chimney to give you um, a thought of what soot is. This is wood soot, so not oil and resin soot like the um, lamp black, but actual burnt wood soot is what uh, Bistra is made with. And then before I get to the last one here, I'm just going to insert another little explanation just of a word that we hear a lot when we're talking about ink, uh, and that's sepia. So when you're looking at old black and white photos, like really old, that have turned kind of a brownish color, that tone and that color is called sepia. And also that is used to describe more brownish colors of ink drawings. Um, sepia is an actual kind of ink, um, but it's not usually the way people use the word. So true sepia is a substance, a kind of ink that's derived from the ink sac of a cuttlefish. A cuttlefish is kind of like a squid, you know, squids will spray ink at you. So cuttlefish also have an ink sac. So uh, sepia is made out of their ink sac and it's super difficult to make. Um, and so it's almost never found in drawings. It's very, very unusual. Um, but the color it makes is that kind of old brownish faded looking color. So the word sepia comes from this ink made from the ink sacs of this fish um, and is used to describe other brown inks, basically. Okay, so that's just like a little interjection there. 
Uh, the fourth kind of ink that is really commonly used in drawing is called logwood. So in the 19th century, logwoods and then the early synthetic inks like um, anilines is the most common kind of synthetic early ink, gradually replaced iron gall, basically because they're easier to make. Um, so uh, that's what this long wood ink is on the end. It's, it's made out of kind of wood. Um, and most notably, uh, long wood, log wood ink is the prefer, was the preferred ink of another famous artist named Vincent Van Gogh. So for all of his drawings, he liked to use ink and he particularly liked to use log wood ink. So there you go. Let's look at some examples. So this is pen and ink. So this is either done with like a contemporary Micron pen or a uh, fine point Sharpie or can be done with a pen nib, like a nib uh, pen or a quill pen to make these kind of really controlled little lines. And then brush and ink generally is a little looser and more expressive, though you see from the brush and ink puma here, it can be a little bit more controlled. And so those are different ways that ink is used as a drawing medium. Um, and lastly, I just want to touch on digital media. Um, when I was younger and was an undergrad, digital media was a little bit scoffed at by people in fine arts programs um, because it was new and because people are snobby and silly. Digital media is super relevant today. It's really important and it's becoming a larger and larger um, chunk of, of what we think of as fine arts and especially when those fine arts are applied in more pragmatic ways. But digital media is used a lot. Digital drawing is uh, very common and very popular and it's really difficult. It takes the same kind of skill set as uh, analog drawing. So I like to include it here. It's not included in most texts about this, but I just think it's important to say that that is real drawing. That is very difficult uh, skill. And it's pretty rad because with the different software that you use to create digital drawings and with the different kinds of um, styluses and things you can use, you can buy all these add-ons and things to your software that create different effects. So with the correct digital software and tools, you can make an effect that looks like any of the things we talked about today, just on your tablet. So, you know, there's Adobe, Photoshop, all these kinds of things and all different kinds of brush effects that you can download um, and create with. So I just like to include, I don't digital art is not my area, um, but it is very relevant and it is definitely a real form of drawing and should be respected as such. So I like to include a little bit about it there. All right, so that's drawing. So next we will talk about painting. All right, thanks.